tonight. Recording in progress, it says, so we're going to get going. Uh, some other folks might tune in here, so I might have to admit them, but otherwise we are getting started. So share screen, PowerPoint, share, slideshow, admit this person, slideshow from beginning. And okay, so I'm going to start with putting my information in the chat window. So if you end up with questions after the fact, you're welcome to just give me a shout, call with questions, email with questions, A okay. I really don't mind. You know, it just has to be grammatically correct. That's the only requirement. Okay, so my name is Kevin. Uh, tell me if we have any sound issues. We did a sound check already, so we should be fine. We are doing Denver through the decades, 1950s. We've made it up to our city's 100th birthday this year. And we've been talking about a lot over the years. Let's get. All right, there I am, more contact information. I need to update that picture as my hair is growing out. So here we go. I mentioned in the, oh, what was it? The description for each presentation that was going to go with each one, uh, that the 1950s was going to be a kind of sad and difficult time for Denver. And indeed it was. We're going to talk about why. Not that everything was horrid, but for, it was really the first time where Denver ran into some problems it had never experienced before and we didn't know what to do. So let's talk a little bit about it. I could really spend the entire presentation just talking about this, but that would be dull. So we're not going to do that. One of my colleagues, Tom Noel, wrote a great paper on Denver in the 1950s. And so I have taken out a few little bits of that uh, because when Dr. Colorado says it, then it must be so. So regional growth, we had tons of folks moving in here, especially after the war. Many folks had become charmed with the weather here, with the sunshine, et cetera, and moved here. The GI Bill saw a lot of students come into the metro area. But as much as Denver's population growth was amazing in the 1950s, what happened in the counties around us was truly astronomical. So I've written some numbers up here. I'll let you just look at the numbers as I go. And a lot of folks around us, the communities around us could see that whole writing on the wall thing. Denver began to annex around it. So cities began to form around us for varying reasons, but often it was to prevent themselves from being incorporated into Denver and to take over greater control as things began to expand with their populations. So for example, Greenwood Village, Glendale, these are some of the cities that incorporated so that they could avoid being annexed into Denver. Commerce Town, uh, they decided that they would incorporate, even though they didn't have the gigantic population uh, onrush quite at this moment, but they could see it coming. Uh, Thornton was one of those post-war suburbs, uh, absolutely. Just one of the places where tract housing gave rise to a city. Today, the only part of Thornton that's really of age would be the East Lake area. Uh, the actual beginning of the city of Thornton, those show homes went in the 1950s, uh, one of them designed by Jane Russell, which is an exciting story. Bomar and Columbine Valley, both in the South Metropolitan area, uh, they wanted to maintain their flavor for Bomar and Columbine Valley wanted to solidify its golfing. So if you look at the pictures here that I have, my colleague, Sean, uh, wrote a book, Denver City Park and Whittier Neighborhoods, and I helped with the pictures and some of the captions and such. He wrote the book. I just did a little labor. And he interviewed the Van Loon daughters. And so here you see two pictures from the Van Loons, talks about their family story in the park, uh, in the park, I'm sorry, in the neighborhood, the original neighborhood, which is the picture on the left. So that's going to be up in the coal neighborhood. And if you look at the picture on the right, they ended up moving over to Lakewood. So they moved from the inner ring, original streetcar suburbs on the left to the bright, shiny new suburbs in, 
in this case, Lakewood. And we really got an earful as to why that happened. And that comes around to some of the problems in this time period. So I've got this whole article from Tom. Tom says, my house was built in 1956. Uh, there were an awful lot of, sorry, it's too dark in here for me to see this. Uh, there were an awful lot of houses built in the Denver area, 1946 and onward. All those supplies were then, uh, that were from the war era, all those were then turned to housing and other things for the new burgeoning communities. The Queen Anne mansions of the past were being cut down and turned into apartments. Capitol Hill was no longer an enclave for the rich and the wealthy. Those folks had gone on. They'd either died or lost their fortunes as coal and mining and railroads came to be less important. So at this time period, we really were seeing that watershed movement to the suburbs. And the phrase a lot of people like to throw around is white flight. Uh, I've done a lot of reading on this subject. It is a very complex story. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Before we do that, let's go to our wonderful slides here from my colleague at Denver Urbanism. So as we normally do, we cycle through the 30 years before the decade, after the decade, and the one we're looking at. So as a reminder, what you're seeing in this picture, the gray spots were the ones that had already been developed, the plots that had already been developed. The red was what was developed during that decade. So as we talked about in our last presentation, not as much was done in the 40s because the whole first half of the decade really saw very little development. So here's the second half of the 1940s, but get ready, ladies and gentlemen, watch this. Boom, look at all that development, especially in the southwestern part of the city. So Harvey Park, Bear Valley, Marley, and we start going over toward the University of Denver in the southeast. So lots of expansion in the 1950s. Tracked houses became de rigueur and everyone wanted one. As Tom said, folks were super interested in getting out of the cramped inner city, out of their little apartments. They wanted their acres of uh, space around them with shiny new houses, with all the amenities, which included, of course, picket fences and air conditioning, and they wanted the space. So the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. So my mother-in-law's house, which is where I'm doing my presentation tonight, uh, we visit twice a week. Uh, my mother-in-law's house would have been from this time period here you see in the 1940s. So my mother-in-law would have grown up in this post-war uh, explosion there in the 1950s and 60s. So obviously this is a presentation that you may watch the recording of later if you'd like to look at these slides a little more fully. And I do have all of these if any of you ever want me to send them off to you to examine more fully on your own. Okay, as an example of what was around us, I found this great picture of the city of Lafayette. Now, most of you know Lafayette, I'm sure, because you go to the most amazing food festival in Colorado, which happens in January, and that, of course, is the Oatmeal Festival. This year, I'm so sad. Uh, it's not the weekend I thought it was going to be. They pushed it back a week, so I'm actually gonna be in Florida for a uh, tour. So I'm gonna miss the Oatmeal Festival, so you're gonna have to go without me. But here you see Lafayette, that wonderful city built on coal mining. Look, where is it? You can see just a little bit of the city here. This is why so many people were moving to the areas around us in those counties outside of Denver. You had lots of space. So Lafayette, its growth really began sure. in the 1950s. Hold a moment, please. That's yeah. small than rumor for Christ's sake. Yeah. Hold on. So after the Boulder, uh, Denver Boulder Turnpike went in, you really saw Lafayette, Louisville, Superior begin to explode. But all of the areas around us were so empty, tons of folks could move in there. It was super easy to build. And here is what they were building. This is an ad for the Cary Homes. I have another ad that I like to look at for Cliff May Homes. Uh, back in the day, tract housing, of course, made popular there at Levittown in New York. Uh, took the whole country by storm, and we built many, many of them. So as you see in the advertisement in the lower right-hand side, every day 
could be a holiday if you live in one of the Cary holiday homes. Today, these places in Southwest Denver, which is where these pictures were taken, super popular. Folks love these mid-century modern houses. And what were they leaving behind? Well, they were be leaving behind a inner city that was doing two things. Number one, in the 1950s, it started to build up. Denver got its first skyscraper, which you see here. This is the Mile High Center in 1954. This was the first time we built one of those wonderful ultra modern skyscrapers. The skyscrapers in Denver really sort of came in two waves. They're in the 50s, and then we got another batch in the 1980s. We're back at it now after a long delay from the 80s into the early part of this century. But this is the one that started it all. And believe it or not, this one was built on the ruins of the Tabor Mansion. So we remember the stories of the Tabors from all those decades uh, before the last of them uh, died there with Elizabeth. That house sadly would not survive to the modern day. That site today is under the Mile High Center, which does still stand. So one of the things we were doing in the 50s was building up. The other thing we were doing was tearing down. The 1950s saw the beginning of a great spasm of destruction in Denver. This picture, obviously, it no longer looks like that, but it illustrates exactly what we were doing with downtown. You see the Daniels and Fisher clock tower there. You see the uh, down and to the left of it, they're in the process of building Skyline Park. But downtown was a massive expanse of asphalt. As Tom Noel said, if you look at pictures of downtown in 1940, there is not a parking lot anywhere to be seen. It was solid buildings. If you look at it now, and he wrote this several years ago, uh, it is half asphalt. Now that of course was for multiple reasons. People were moving out of the suburb or out into the suburbs, partly because they wanted to get away from it all. Downtown Denver was having issues with disinvestment in its core. Also, they wanted the new types of houses. Your car allowed you to get out, enjoy greater freedom. And we were moving to new forms of shopping, such as the Cherry Creek Mall, which is why the Daniels and Fisher department store was one of the victims of that uh, era of demolition. Uh, we are going to see this become a true hemorrhage in the 1960s. The 50s were still a little calm. But that's one of the things that we were doing. Okay, so one of the folks who is listening tonight or watching and listening, Ernesto and Trish. Hello, Ernesto and Trish. I can't see you, but I know you're there because I saw you check in. After we talked last month, Ernesto wrote me and I did try to find pictures, but I wasn't able to find anything. So I'm just gonna read out what Ernesto wrote. During the 1950s, there were three serious crashes in Denver. 1951, a B-29A called the 20th Century Limited crashed near Eudora and Bayod, killing eight. Four homes were demolished. In November of 1956, a 28th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing flight out of Ellsworth Air Force Base in Rapid City crash landed at the western boundary of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal while attempting to reach Stapleton after departing Lowry and suffering engine failure. No nuclear bombs were involved, but with limited reporting, we're not 100% sure, I guess, and there were unknown injuries. However, the most famous of the crashes during the 1950s would be this one here. Uh, this happened November 1st, 1955, a flight uh, out of Denver, heading up to Oregon with uh, 50, I think it was 50 or 40, let me look here, 44 people aboard, took off from Stapleton, 11 minutes later, it blew up, killing the 39 passengers and the five crew. It was later learned that the fellow that you see there on the right had taken out some insurance policies on his mother, and then in the end, he put uh, dynamite into her luggage. Uh, this is, by the way, I actually realized I didn't say the name, Jack Gilbert Graham. Uh, he blew her up along with everyone else on the plane. 
uh, so that he could collect the insurance money. Interestingly, in the annals of American history, this is really the first moment when the FBI kind of stepped in to see about helping to determine what had actually happened. They actually reconstructed the airplane. They looked through everything, well, reconstructed the airplane as much as they could in a hangar to try to determine what had happened. And they were able to determine that something in the luggage had exploded. And with that, they were able to look at some of the remnants of the luggage. They traced it all the way back to this guy. Uh, in the end, the uh, jurors found him guilty and he was executed. So what is that about two years later, year and a half, maybe this guy uh, was executed. Very famous story in Denver, obviously a very sad story. Think of those poor people. Yeehaw, but there he is. Uh, after he was executed, his house here in Southwest Denver was demolished. It currently is a taco house, a new building on the same site. Uh, I think they really wanted to wipe out the memory of this man. So they literally demolished his house so as to get rid of it. All right. Now, I've actually shared this story with some people, and some people like it, and others do not. It has not uh, received universal acclaim, but this is the story of Dr. Cog. So Dr. Cog stands for the Denver Regional Council of Government, and some people really, really like it. I'm a fan of greater interconnectivity, of growing closer together rather than farther apart. But I've had people complain about Dr. Cog saying it reduces their individual will as a city or a county. Regardless, it's a done deal. And I, I don't know, I think it's a good thing. So the Denver Regional Council, Council of Governments was created in 1955. The effort uh, was put out there, uh, or excuse me, the idea was put out there in an effort to get all these local governments to work together as the cities especially around Denver, grew astronomically on projects that affected the entire area, which included transportation and urban growth and the quality of life that these two things uh, would require us to address. So if you look here, this is the service area or the inclusion area for Dr. Cog. The orange areas are part of the uh, metropolitan planning or uh, organization, especially for transit. And then the areas uh, in the green there are still part of the boundary, but they don't require them to be served with RTD. So everything that is in the orange here uh, is obligated to be served by RTD. This is an outgrowth of that, which is great in many ways because we come up with a uniform idea over this whole area of what transit should be. Now, obviously, it serves some areas more than other. If you, others, if you look at the right-hand side there, where you see the blue, that is where the population is in those areas. So you're going to have your RTD services to those areas, not to other areas. So Dr. Cog came in. It is uh, among the very first intergovernmental agencies at the local level in the entire United States. So we did really something visionary and amazing with the creation of Dr. Cog, I think. And I hope if you don't know about Dr. Cog, you'll look into it because it's a cool story. Okay, the Denver Coliseum went in. So we've talked about the National Western Stock Show before. The stock show began in 1906 and they put in a number of structures to allow the stock show to be able to work, but we needed more space. So in 1951, the Denver Coliseum opened. You see it here. And this is not just for the National Western Stock Show. It is also for other events throughout the year. It is part of the same complex, although I will tell you that the current renovation of the Stock Show site is only on the north side of I-70. So it does not include this building right here. So this place has seen lots of things. Uh, concerts and ice skating and auto shows. Uh, the Denver Pow Wow, the last time I went at least, uh, took place here. Uh, gem and mineral shows. I mean, all of these things happen here. The Denver Coliseum is actually a property of the city. So it's one of these things that we maintain for 
the function of the city, all these folks coming in and the city uh, rents it out for various functions. Long term, this building may be renovated, maybe even demolished. I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon, but 1951 is when it went up. And if you haven't been in there, it's functional, not beautiful. All right, now there are a lot of stories that I know from the 1950s just because I learned my history. This is one that I just sort of stumbled upon as I was writing this, which I had actually not known. Uh, so I did some reading about it and I was a little mizzy mazed to learn all about uh, what happened up at Rocky Flats. So the US Atomic Energy Commission, hold on, I have to admit someone there, okay. The U.S. Atomic Energy Commission Rocky Flats plant construction began in 1951. They manufactured triggers, uh, plutonium detonators, and other elements of uh, the nuclear weapons that we built in the 1950s and onward. The plant would eventually be closed in the 1980s after multiple raids and multiple citations for environmental uh, crimes. Basically, they were breaking the law often and regularly as concerns the environment. Now, when I took my tour of Rocky Flats years ago, uh, everyone joked that I was going to come back radioactive. And maybe that's true. Uh, the federal government would end up making this into a Superfund site. The and they did, wasn't anywhere near they the hurricane. did declare it safe. Hold on just a moment, please. Okay. Uh, they did declare it safe to be a what is it, an animal sanctuary, which is what it is today. Rocky Flats is not for housing, it's for, uh, for wee beasties. Uh, but one of the things that folks were worried about is that legacy of toxic leaks out of the plant. And so I did some reading about it. This was amazing. In September of 1957, there was a fire. I have no idea what this part means, but I'm just gonna read it out. A small amount of alpha plutonium turnings uh, spontaneously ignited and it spread. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, the person in the hazmat gear is pointing at the spot where the fire started. Uh, the firefighters uh, from the plant arrived, but apparently they spent a lot of time arguing about how best to attack the fire, by which time it had spread and then ended up blowing up part of the building. And there was all this dark smoke rising up. And afterward, it, it took them about 15, 16 hours to get the uh, fire shut down and, and dead. During that time, quote, uh, the draft undoubtedly contributed to the intensity and spread of the fire in the filters. The exhaust fans having been turned on, uh, as an early consequence, or excuse me, as an early decision in fighting the fire. Uh, in the end, they believe that actually helped to flush some of the toxins outside, which I guess was great if you were inside, but it also sent it outside uh, into the wider world. So the fire was put out. There were lots of uh, citations, things that were done wrong, things that weren't working correctly. They re-examined their firefighting protocols, but yeah, in the end, it was a bit of a uh, maniacal mistake. So if you look at the map in the lower middle there, this is a map put out a, a showing the legacy of pollution from Rocky Flats that took place over many decades. Now, I do want you to know that if you live in this area, it doesn't mean you're doomed. It just means that they have found higher and possibly uh, worrisome uh, levels of certain toxic and radioactive materials in the area. I will also let you know that the exact extent to which this area has been uh, damaged or how often these things happened is still being debated. I did not find any absolute agreement on this. So some people say it's much worse. Some people say it's much less. So it is still being discussed. The federal government has uh, declared that multiple general small pollution events escaping happened over the many, many decades, in addition to multiple fires, including the one there in 1957. So yay, Arvada. 
If you haven't been on a tour of Rocky Flats, I had a great time. I didn't come back glowing, but I still enjoyed it. Okay, this is one of those things where when I first moved to Denver, I just assumed that the highway up to Boulder, Highway 36, had just always been there, et cetera. Well, of course, once I got here, time to start reading the history books, and I found out that it had once been a toll road, the Denver Boulder Turnpike. So today we don't even think about it, but so it was that the Turnpike was a toll road once upon a time. It opened in 1952, it cost 25 cents. And my favorite story about the Turnpike, in addition to the fact that you can see in the upper left-hand side, no one is built anywhere along its length in this picture. This shows, uh, this is the area where the Interlock and Parkway, Superior, Broomfield, all of those things fill in this area now. But my favorite story, especially if you have been to Broomfield, you'll know this story. They've got a great history museum in Broomfield. And that is the story of the wonderful Shep, the Turnpike Dog. So Shep one day wandered up to one of the toll booths. And you're going to see a picture of that in the lower right-hand side. And basically just adopted the toll booth as his home. So he would become not just a friend of the folks taking the quarter for the toll, but of all the people going along to and from Boulder. People would actually bring Shep food because who doesn't love to spoil a cute little pooch along the way? In the end, Shep was there for many years. Uh, when Shep died, uh, he would end up getting buried on the site right there with the toll booth. As they later expanded Highway 36, Shep would be disinterred and is now buried over near the Broomfield Depot Museum. So the next time you go there, uh, say hello to Shep. Some other things that happened concerning roads in, uh, in the 1950s. Oh, by the way, the Boulder Denver Turnpike was so successful, it paid itself off in 1967. So in 1956, the Federal Interstate Highways Act was signed. That would give us the interstate that Eisenhower so wanted and that we love today or hate. I-25 was begun in 1958. This was a continuation of the Valley Highway and expansion on it. And that fed right into the Denver Boulder Turnpike we see here. The, uh, in 1958, construction began on what we know today as I-76. I had not actually known that the original name for I-76 was I-80 South. It would later be renamed I-76 in honor of our bicentennial. And down in Douglas County and El Paso County, the Monument Valley Freeway was begun in 1955, later becoming part of I-25. So in the 50s, we started to build roads. All right, this is a story a little bit connected to me, only a tiny bit. Uh, all three of my brothers went to the Air Force Academy, and I find it very Oh, remarkable that it didn't start out there. That's one of the stories I learned as well. Believe it or not, the Air Force Academy started right here in Denver and a little bit in Aurora at Lowry. So after the United States government chose Colorado Springs for the site in 1954, the first cadets came into Lowry, 1955, because there was no academy yet. So the academy had to be built so if you look here, we have pictures from the time that the Air Force Academy was at Lowry. The upper left-hand side, some of the facilities built at the time. The cadets, of course, all men. That wouldn't change until the 1970s. Here on the right-hand side, and they tested planes. That's what you do at the Air Force Academy. So the cadets there on the left -hand, lower left-hand side are uh, coming from testing a, an aircraft there. So eventually, the Air Force Academy, of course, would be built and the cadets would move there. The first graduating class of cadets, 1959, did start at Lowry. One of those first graduates said, I walked through the gates at Lowry on July 11th, 1955, marched in by a bunch of NCOs. An officer came up to me and he did not like a thing about me. There were all sorts of things he was personally going to fix. Welcome to the military. So right here in the Denver and a bit of Aurora area, 
the Air Force Academy began. All right. Now, this is a story that I did not know. Although my mother, believe it or not, my mother loved watching the uh, Miss American pageant. She just thought it was great. She liked to see all the dresses and watch all the talent pieces and all that. Uh, the very first Miss America from Colorado was during our time period, 1955. This is the lovely Sharon K. Ritchie. Ritchie was 18 at the time, which is amazing because in that picture right there on the lower right hand side she doesn't look 18 she looks older but there it was she was our first winner from Colorado believe it or not this was not the only first that happened at this Miss America pageant yes it was the first Miss Colorado ever chosen but it was also the first time that the song there she is Miss America was performed so that's kind of cool so Sharon K. Ritchie would have been the first one to have that song sung as she walked down the runway with her tiara and her roses and her scepter of office. I believe we have had three Miss Americas from Colorado, if I recall correctly, and this is the first. All right. Now, yesterday I was talking with some folks at the El Pueblo Museum in Pueblo. And I made a mistake that I make every single time. I, I don't, know, don't know why I do this, but I always call it the Hatch Chili Festival. And the two ladies there were not pleased. It's not the Hatch Chili Festival, it's just the Chili Festival. There are certain things, even after all these years, I can never remember. I know that President Eisenhower had his event in 1955 here in Denver. The thing I can never remember was it a heart attack or a stroke? So I looked it up here. Eisenhower had an acute myocardial infarction in Denver in 1955. And I think, I think that is a heart attack, but I wanted to get the term right, an acute myocardial infarction, which sounds amazing, even though I bet it was painful. So the reason Eisenhower spent so much time here in Denver is because his wife, Mamie Dowd, graduated from East High School here in Denver, and she was the belle of the ball in Denver society for many years. Her family remained in Denver, and they came frequently to visit. 1955, he had his heart attack. He was treated at uh, Fitzsimmons, which is what you're seeing here in the pictures on the left and right. The left is one of the places where he would sit when he was feeling up to being out of his bed, and there on the right-hand side, it doesn't look that big for a president but that was the bed for President Eisenhower was, while he was convalescing here, here in Denver. For those of you who, who have not yet been to this museum, at least pre-COVID, it was free. I don't actually know what it is now. I hope it's still free. Uh, the museum at least is still there. So if you haven't been, you may go learn all about President Eisenhower and his time. He did end up getting well enough to where he moved to the Brown Palace Hotel and he conducted affairs of state from the Brown Palace Hotel, which is why the Brown Palace Hotel has since then claimed the title, the White House of the West. And in fact, every president since Eisenhower, but one has stayed at the Brown Palace Hotel in the presidential suite. So 1955, we're glad he survived because what is it? I like Ike. All right, even though this did not actually happen in Denver, uh, I felt I had to talk about it because it is so tied up with Colorado as a whole. I just felt I had to say it. Okay, so hold on just a moment. Uh, someone is saying uh, all of the wonderful parallels between her life and uh, the folks there at Lowry and Fitzsimmons and their experiences. I love it. Thank you for sharing. Uh, okay. Uh, in the very first presentation that I did, we talked about the arrival of the Tabers. Do you have a photo of the Tabor house that was torn down from the high rise? Yes, I do. If you shoot me an email, I will be able to send you a copy of that photo. So I, I totally have that picture. Just send me an email and I'll send it your way. Uh, where was I? 
Oh, yes. In the very first presentation we did, we talked about the Tabers. And we continued talking about the Tabers until the 1930s. Basically, every decade had something to share about the Tabers. So that legend, of course, became the story of Colorado. Rags to riches to rags again. Folks love it. No one's particularly worried about Augusta and her story, but they love the story of Elizabeth McCourt Doe Tabor, a.k.a. Baby Doe. So in 1956, the world premiere of that wonderful opera, The Ballad of Baby Doe, there in Central City, you see the opera house on the lower right-hand side. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have not yet seen The Ballad of Baby Doe, it usually plays every 10 years, and you absolutely must go. It is required. It is the quintessential story, and it's worth it. I'm not a fan of opera. I've been to a few. They're not terrible. It's just not something I go to, but I loved it. It was great because it's so telling of the stories that we know of our state's history. And there are four lines you need to pay attention when you see, uh, or hear, I should say, and see, the opera. These were on the curtain there at the Tabor Grand Opera House. They were from a parable. It goes like this. So fleet the works of men back to earth again. Ancient and holy things fade like a dream. Basically a warning that nothing stays. And they sing those four lines in the opera. And if you know your history and if you know the importance of those four lines, I'm a pretty, actually, what am I saying? I, I cry super easily. I was, all a, I was all a blubber listening to that because it was a very powerful thing. So if you haven't, you should go. 1956, it happened, but they do it every 10 years or so. It's worth a watch. The Ballad of Baby Doe. Okie dokie, on we go. So Denver's first library that was dedicated to be a library only still stands. It is no longer a library. It's now, uh, the McNichols building is now, I think it's an art space. It's at the northwest corner of Civic Center Park. In 1955, Burnham Hoyt was hired to build a new library at the south central part of Civic Center Park. If you look at the picture here, the building, the buff colored or tan colored section that is closer to us in this picture, that is the Burnham Hoyt 1955 library. When it was built, of course, it was a huge expansion, had all new technologies. It was a great, great building. 40 years later, uh, it's still there, but as you see, the section on the rear uh, was added. That's Michael Graves. Uh, oh, wait. Someone is saying the Ballad of Baby Doe just played in 2020. What? I missed it because I, well, yeah, I didn't see it in 2020. That would be super surprising because everything would have been closed. All right, I'm gonna to have to look into that more uh, because I did a tour, I thought it was probably about 2015 or 2016. So I'm gonna to have to look into it. I'm gonna make myself a note. Anyway, the library, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't been in there, uh, that section closer to us there, that went in 1955 and is worth a tour. They do offer free tours of the library. And if you haven't done it, you might think it would be boring, but it really is not. It's a really great tour, one for you to look into into the future. Da, 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 da. Okay, we continue. You know, I know you know this, that I love anything to do with the history of water in the West. As I think it was Mark Twain said, uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. So I have tried during these presentations sort of to follow along with how Denver has managed its water. Uh, we're still fighting over it today. In 1959, the Williams Fork Reservoir, and that's the dam you see at the upper left-hand side, was uh, expanded into a hydroelectric plant. Now the reservoir had actually been built in 1938, but it was just a dam. But they decided that it could be both. So in 1959, it became Denver's first hydroelectric plant uh, providing not just the reserve of water, but also the electricity. Denver Water now has seven hydroelectric plants, generating more than enough power for all of its Denver water facilities, pump stations, and treatment plants. 
So, and obviously we have more electricity that, uh, that comes from it. This uh, train car that you see here in the main picture, these are some of the pieces that are going off to build that plant. So 1959, the Williams Fork Reservoir was turned into a hydroelectric plant. All right, now for those of you who've traveled with me a lot over the years, oops, sorry, my computer blipped there. Uh, you know that I love to do the tours of Colfax and that my favorite thing on earth to do is eat. And if you haven't been there, you should go to the wonderful Davies Chuck Wagon Diner. So on the left-hand side, you see the diner and the sign, the iconic sign way back in the day. Higher on the right-hand side, you see a more recent picture. Uh, believe it or not, that diner was built, it was uh, manufactured, that's the right word, manufactured on the East Coast. These uh, metallic shell restaurants were a common thing and you could actually have them built and shipped to you. And then once you got them to your city, you could put them together and have a diner. We have multiple examples of these around the nation. Here in Denver, ours was and is Davies Chuck Wagon Di Diner, prefabricated steel eatery. Now, the city of Lakewood took umbrage with this sign. They wanted the sign to be taken down because it no longer fits in with Lakewood's sign code. But I am so happy to tell you that the citizens of Lakewood basically lost their mind saying, no way, you are not gonna tear down our historic sign. And I am really grateful that the government of Lakewood listened. And today you may still enjoy Davies Chuck Wagon Diner with its original sign. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1950s, I know none of you uh, were alive at that time, but this was the wonderful era of neon and all of the themed restaurants and gas stations and motels along its length would have had this wonderful neon to tell you where they were and to entice you into staying there. When we do the, uh, oh, someone was saying I was born in 54. Okay, well, I guess someone sneaked in there, but I know that most of you here are very young, as I am. Uh, as you go along Colfax, you see lots of these things. And now we've, uh, with Davies, that's the, la uh, the last of the diners, but we have more motels to talk about. If you haven't done the Colfax tour with me, we should do that at some point. My favorite of the signs still standing along Colfax is the aristocrat that you have there on the left-hand side. I don't know, there's just something about that sign and that motel that just makes me happy. The aristocrat, unfortunately, may end up being torn to the ground. I've heard the scuttlebutt that it may. Now, those of you who've traveled with me a long time, you already know the story, but I'd like you to look at the sign on the right-hand side, the Big Bunny Motel. Now, notice the word big. There's a gap between B and I in the word big. Doesn't need to be such a big gap. And then if you notice after the G, there seems to be some unused letter there, a ghost letter. What's going on? Now, if we were together, I would ask you what you think the original name of this motel was. But since we are not together, I'm just gonna go ahead and show you. The original name of this was da -da -da, the Bugs Bunny Motel. They got rid of the left-hand side of the U and they just de-neoned the S. So the Bugs Bunny Motel, they got in trouble, copyright infringement, and were told, uh-uh, got to take it down. So they did, but barely, and this is what it became. So I have some sad news for you. This wonderful, iconic, hysterically funny sign on the right-hand side, sadly, uh, blew down in a windstorm back in... Oh, 2015 or 2016. So the sign is no longer with us. And the new sign just says the Big Bunny Motel without any cheeky snark to it. So goodbye, Bugs Bunny Motel. I'm not sure what's going on with Bugs Bunny's hand there holding the carrot. You know, I never noticed that before. I think he's missing a finger. Huh, that's funny. Is it here too? 
Oh yeah, I guess it is here too. All right, that's that's vaguely disquieting. I'm not sure what's going on. So we're gonna move past that because it's gross. Okay, so what industry was so important in building Denver that it is featured on our city seal? Well, you get a hint. That is an old smelter smokestack. That was for the globe smelter. The globe smelter, depending on which history book you read, uh, was the largest or among the top five largest, again, depending on which book you read, smelter in the world once upon a time. And we were smelting all that ore that we were bringing down from the mountainside. So the uh, smelter itself was built in 1892, and the smelter uh, was, I'm sorry, the, hold on. Da -da 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 -da. The smokestack was built in 1892 as an extension of the already extant smelter. Uh, 11 years later, the smelter would be torn down, which meant that the smokestack here really only served for about 11 years. Uh, eventually, in 1951, I think it was, let me look here. 1951, yes. Eventually, the smokestack would be demolished some folks in the community tried to have it saved. It was such an iconic piece of our city. And it features in our city seal that you see on the left-hand side there. Look at that gray smokestack with the smoke coming out of it. That is the smokestack from the globe smelter. Unfortunately, it was demolished. The city did not want to spend the money it would take to repair the cracks in its base. According to the estimates the city put out, uh, they may have had in excess of 200,000 people turn out to watch it be demolished. So apparently that was a uh, high entertainment back in the day. So 1951, we lost our smelter smokestack. As I was looking through some of the pictures for tonight's presentation, I did find some that aren't specific to anything important, but I just thought were fun. The picture on the left-hand side, that is what would today be the 16th Street Mall. And you notice it is packed. According to the caption that goes with the picture, this picture was taken on December 24th, 1956. So it was the uh, Christmas rush. And even though the Cherry Creek Mall was already drawing a lot of people away from shopping downtown, you still had a lot of folks that were in the habit that would end up disappearing. But this wonderful image, just look at all those cars. And here on the right hand side, uh, this picture was taken uh, in that same decade showing so just the general street scene in downtown Denver. Anyway, I just thought these two were fun. Not tied to anything but the decade. Okay, now as downtown Denver begins to fade, there is another street that ends up taking on great importance, and that's Colorado Boulevard. Colorado Boulevard would have the um, Riders Manor built. So Riders Manor went up in 1955. It was, quote, the country club of highway motels. You see it there on the left-hand side. 105 rooms featured, quote, spacious recreational grounds, landscape gardens, swimming pools, the services in the hotel are everything of the latest. It is arranged so that those wishing for the motel experience uh, may park their cars by their rooms. Uh, suites and rooms ranged from $850 to $45 a night, which would be anywhere from $70 to $400 today. The restaurant that they had on site, the famous Tiffin Inn, you see one of the menus there on the right-hand side. This is illustrating uh, that the uh, the Colorado Boulevard became the place to be. And someone is saying, I think my mom worked there. We had a shower for one sister there. Much prettier than what is on the site now. Yes, right now it's a Best Buy, unfortunately. They did tear this to the ground. Um, another thing that they ended up putting in on Colorado Boulevard, oh, where on Colorado Boulevard, just north of I-25, there's a Best Buy on the east side of Colorado Boulevard. That is where the Writer's Manor was. Uh, south of I-25, they put in the University Hills Plaza. This is one of those islands of shopping away from downtown. 
the University Hills Shopping Complex uh, opened in 1955. It had all of the stores you would need. Uh, Dave Cook Sporting Goods, Fashion Bar, the May Company ended up moving in. So this would have been the place to go shopping. Now the University Hills Plaza sign you see here on the right hand side is still there. Uh, but the original shopping area, Ryder Manor was on Mexico and Colorado Boulevard. Yes, just to the southeast there where the Best Buy is. So University Hills still there, uh, just looks significantly different now from what it was. Now, last month we mentioned that the Bob Stanley was getting his flying with the Air Force and he eventually settled in, uh, in Denver. In 1954, he opened Stanley Aviation, which you see here. Stanley Aviation would end up becoming the city of Aurora's largest employer and they manufactured ejection seats as you see being tested here. So uh, Stanley Aviation, which is right on the border between Denver and Aurora, which is now the Stanley Marketplace, uh, opened there in the 1950s. Now I'm gonna run out of time here, I knew I would, but the main thing that happened in this decade, as far as I'm concerned, it's a super sad story, but in 1950, we got rid of a giant streetcar system among the top five largest streetcar systems in the nation. Here on the right-hand side, you see Mayor Craig Newton. The second paragraph, Saturday, June 3rd, 1950, the date of this publication marks the retirement of all streetcars. And uh, the third paragraph, less than two years ago, it was thought that the program now completed could not possibly be finished before 1953. It is therefore a real pleasure for me to congratulate the Denver Tramway Corporation upon its remarkable achievement in reaching the desired goal. What was that goal? The removal of a giant streetcar system that now you and I are paying billion dollars to put a tiny fraction of back in place. So a real lack of vision at the time, but that's another story. So here is that final day for the streetcars. And this picture here on the left-hand side, I zoomed in at the map or not the map, I'm sorry, the poster on the front, you see that the streetcar is crying. Goodbye, old friends, my last day, June 3rd. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a couple things. Save the date, please join us for our unveiling of next year's tours. Everything from two hour walking tours up to big old tours. We're, we're going back international next year. Not all of our tours are gigantic. Many of our tours are local, just regular tours. November 18th, please join us for our Setting the Course. It is an in-person and online event. So please do join us, if at all possible, from six to eight on the evening of November 18th. If you need information, just contact me and I will get you all set. I am going to uh, write my contact in to the chat here again. And the first of our, the first three of our big tours for next year are also out. You may register National Parks of South Florida, Yellowstone in winter and the auroras of Alaska. So folks do please join in. I'd love to have you. All right, at this point, we're gonna move over to any questions that there might be. So notice how dark it got. I'm glad I have the light on. All right, so folks, uh, thank you for the kind words there. If you have any questions, just type them into the chat window. We'll get you all set. If I don't know the answer, I will find the answer and I will email you after the event. We have the 1960s next month uh, and we're just gonna march on right into the modern day, although we'll be finishing next year. Woohoo! all right. If you have no questions, I'll just turn you loose, I guess. And yes, we have some haunted tours coming up here super, super soon. It's too bad I'm such a scaredy cat. All righty, I don't see any questions coming in. So folks, I'm gonna turn you loose. I hope you have a great evening. I hope to see you at setting the course. What about the centennial celebration? 
you know, they did have a centennial celebration in Denver, but uh, it wasn't particularly, uh, what was it? Photographed. I didn't find any super great uh, pictures. Where is the streetcar that was in the old spaghetti factory? I thought it was still in there. When I went in for putt-putt golf, I did think it was still in there, but maybe I'm misremembering. But I need to go back in and play putt-putt again and make sure. All righty, folks, if you have any questions, shoot me an email or a phone call. I'll see you again soon. Bye, Pat. Bye, Ed. I see you there. Okay, bye.